everyone, I'm Dr. Kelly Starrett from the Ready State, and we are thrilled to be partnering with GORUCK for Suicide Awareness Month. One of the things we're gonna to try to do during this Chad 1000 spin up is break some of the mystique down around the positions, show you how you can use this to have a better self-assessment of how you're moving, how you can better prepare yourself for coming out of this incredible uh, workout intact without being critically sore, and also using this as an idea around uh, sort of a truth test about some of your lifestyle habits. Now, the way it goes is we are huge fans of putting something crazy on the calendar a few months out and then organizing backwards towards those goals and that, that goal, that big event. And one of the reasons we like that is that we can use it as sort of a, a clarifying moment, a, a moment where we get to sort of parse apart some of our lifestyle and our training behaviors and A, focus towards something, which is great to do. It's just fun to actually have a competition, uh, something that's hanging over our heads the way we used to as kids, like having a season. Well, it's Chad 1000 season. So now it's a great opportunity for us to look at our sort of in lifestyle components and use that as a, as a metric of understanding how we're doing because what often happens for a lot of us is that we're fit enough and we're eating well enough and we're sleeping well enough, but as soon as we start to aim the ship at a big event, it turns out that we may not be able to handle the volume or we're, or we're, you know, we can just sort of slide by being mediocre in some of the things that really do lead to better performance, better health, less pain, all those things. So we can use this as an opportunity to just sort of go through our environment. So the first order of business is I want you to start thinking differently about your sleep between now and the, the big day. And the way we think about it, is that seven hours of sleep is your bare minimum. So if you're gonna get seven hours of sleep, that means that, hey, congratulations, you hit your bare minimum. It means you're not gonna have as good an effect or a good out of adaptation response to your exercise. It means that you're not gonna heal as well. It means it's not you're gonna be performing as well, but you're alive. So congratulations on that. Anytime in our professional view of working with athletes across and high performance across as many platforms as you may think, uh, it turns out that we recommend eight hours of sleep as our minimum. Minimum if I want to perform well, minimum if I want to heal, minimum if I want to um, sort of excel at all of the, the potential that I have that's sort of latent in my, in my being. So you may need to be in bed, wait for it, for nine hours to get eight hours. So it's t normal for someone to have about 30 to 60 minutes of sleep disruption a night. So if you're going to bed at 11, getting up at six, you're not actually getting seven hours of sleep. You're getting less than that. And I know you're a very special person, just like all the thousands of other elite special people I know, but it just turns out that that doesn't bear true fruit and uh, doesn't hold up to the sniff test. Think seven is my minimum. Hey, I can still deal and I'm working, but I really want to strive to be eight. One of the ways that we have found to be very successful for this is for people to actually get in bed a half hour early. So if you want to get to a little bit more sleep in and you could just end up in bed a half hour early, chances are you can start to shift that sleep behavior. So number one is sleep. Number two is this is a wonderful opportunity to put more micronutrients into your system. One of the things about the Chad 1000 is it has a high propensity for creating a lot of eccentric load. And even the exposure uh, of stepping up and stepping down on the training ramp up uh, can potentially ask a lot of my connective tissue. And so for the, those of us who are not 19, those of us who are not in our young 20s, our connective tissue, I feel like, is our limiting factor to being successful and coming out intact. It's not your musculature, it's not your drive, it's not your willpower, it's not your VO2 max. It is your ability to withstand those forces and come out of this thing intact. So Connective tissue is based on a couple of things. One is micronutrients, making sure that I'm getting enough fiber and enough sort of the benefits of the fruits and vegetables. Now around here, we love the 800 gram challenge, which means we're gonna to try to eat 800 grams of fruits and vegetables any day. Doesn't matter how you do it, they just can't be fried and they can't be dried, but try to up your micronutrient intake. What you'll see is that that will create a environment where you have all the raw building blocks and all the sort of cofactors to be able to have healthier tissues. The fiber is also gonna make a difference difference. We also are huge fans of trying to track your protein macros. This is the one macro that I go after every day like it's my job. On days where I'm not training very hard, yeah, I pull out some carbohydrate. On days where I'm going heavier I, I, and longer, I add in more carbohydrate. But ultimately, I'm always shooting between 0.7 
and one gram of protein per pound body weight. So that light end means that I'm about 175 grams, and at the high end, I'm at 230 grams. And what you're going to find is you may be under eating, and especially as we get older and try to do these big challenges, we want to make sure that we are keeping those amino acid pools full, and that because we have a little bit of downgraded or downregulated protein synthesis, protein signaling, one of the things that happens is those of us who are a little bit older engaging these big things can benefit from a little bit more protein. Um, when we start to look at that combination of just getting some more protein in, getting some more sort of fruits and vegetables in, getting in some sleep, then we, those are the things I want you to start paying attention to. And because I'm obsessed with this connective tissue health thing, those things make the, the baseline. Do you need to drink some water? Yeah, drink some water every day, of course. The only other thing I would add in there probably, for most of us, we're probably not getting enough meat on the bone, we're not eating enough chicken skin, you're not eating enough cartilage, you're not eating enough broth and stews. So it, during this time when you're starting to really challenge your connective tissue, we feel like best practice is to add 15 grams of collagen protein on top of whatever you're doing. And ideally, if you know you're gonna be training, add that 15 grams of collagen in in the 15 minutes before you, or 15 to 30 minutes before you train. I think that'd be fine. Hour, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, throw in that collagen into whatever you're doing. What you'll see is that your body will call for it when it needs it after training. So we like to have it on board. Again, you don't have to be very precious about that, but it's a perfect time to start seeing if I can take care of my connective tissue for this big load and big dynamic going on. Okay, so now we can talk about sort of expanding this this behavior. And one of the things that you're going to see is you have plenty of opportunities to get on programs that are going to get you dosing the, the response, whether that's starting on uh, a lower box, whether that's you know, starting to work on your step ups without a, without a plate carrier or without a heavy backpack or a ruck, whether that's starting to, sort of to expose you sort of systematically to the volume. What we don't want to do is roll into this thing poorly prepared. At the very least, we want to have some many hundreds of step ups in our back pocket so we give our tissues a chance to adapt. Oftentimes we see people who are doing a lot of rucking and hiking may not be doing the kinds of ballistic exercises, the dynamic loading, especially the lengthening under load, the eccentric work that's required for a workout like Chad 1000, and that ends up potentially causing a lot of tissue disruption and trauma in a, in, in a way that leads us to have a less successful experience and potentially limp around a little bit too much after this big event. Are you gonna be sore? Absolutely. Do you, can you have some control over how sore you are, what kind of sore? You bet your butt. So I wanna give you a few examples of some things that you can work into your warm up every day. Now instead of throwing out the baby with the bathwater, what I'd like to do is add and expand sort of some of your base behaviors so that you can be protecting yourself and sort of beginning to expose some of the shapes and positions that are gonna be required for Chad 1000. So first of all, if you already aren't jump roping, I want you to grab a jump rope and start adding in some jump roping to your, to your daily routine. So one of the reasons that we're gonna work on jump roping is that, believe it or not, most adults aren't doing a lot of jumping volume. And even if you're adding in some box jumps into your workout, the kind of step down eccentric control required for the calf turns out to be a lot. So what we wanna do is start to put some of that eccentric control work in and give ourselves a chance, weeks potentially, to really to, to work on uh, sort of being able to manage that more effectively. Now, what I like is toes together so that I'm not collapsing and letting my feet sl slop around. I like also just to think a simple number. So I'm gonna try to get a couple hundred jumps every single day when I warm up, but then, that's just gonna be a baseline and I just throw it into my warm up. I want you to take your feet and get into a split stance. And this split stance position is literally like me stepping down from the box. So what I'm trying to do is get my calf loaded not in a flexion position, like I'm stepping up and worried about my ankle range of motion. Instead, I'm trying to load that calf with my hip in a little bit more extension. So as I step down, that hip is in extension, and that's the loading that's gonna give us the grief. So what we're gonna do, and you'll see later on, is even if I just go to a little split stance here, it gives me a chance to load that calf a little bit more dynamically, like I'm gonna push off, 
and step down on that calf. So split stance, and of course, I'm a huge fan of even just assisted single leg work. So you use your other leg as you need. If you want to jump single leg, that's fine. Otherwise, you know, scale it with both feet. A little single leg jumping, a little tandem jumping, a couple hundred just regular singles, and you'll see that it'll make a big, big difference. One of the things that you're gonna find is that this is also going to challenge some hip range of motion. So there's a couple other things we can warm up with. One of the things that we can warm up with every single day is some kind of iteration of a walking lunge. What we find as adults in our practice along sports and performance is that most of us are deficient in our ability to effectively extend the hip. I don't mean I'm standing up from a squat. I mean I'm able to bring my knee behind my butt with my torso upright. Now what will end up happening is that if I don't have a ton of the ability to extend the hip on the back leg, then what will end up happening is I fatigue, I'll have to lean forward a lot more, and this puts a lot more load into my butt and legs. So what we're trying to do is be able to keep this torso upright, have movement choice, but if I can't put that leg down as I fatigue and have this hip slightly in extension, what you're gonna see is we're gonna have less movement choice and potentially strain our tissues. So, a couple easy things to do between your warm-up sets for your daily training between now and when you go for this thing is just some walking lunges where you're gonna squeeze your butt the whole time and get practice exposing this leg in extension and teaching yourself to have that glute on. So being really comfortable in these positions as a matter of course. So just some walking lunges, throw those things in. Again, the idea is some for a few. The, Id the idea here is I don't want you to kick out what you're already doing that's being successful, but by adding in some jump roping, adding in some walking lunges, we can begin to expose your tissues to some con considerable positions that are gonna be required. Now in some other videos, we're gonna talk about hip range of motion, we're gonna talk about some of those key pieces around mobilizations that would do to make this position and, and it's easier. But there's a couple other things I wanna show you. One is the rear foot elevated squat. So all you're gonna do is on your box is put your leg behind you and jump out into either some isometrics where you're loading up and just squeezing the butt. This butt is squeezing the back leg and I just hang out here and try to put as much load as I can into this back leg. Sets of 30 seconds, two or three sets, very, very reasonable. If you wanna load that up and do loaded rear foot elevated split squats, fine but I'm really interested in taking you to end range and exposing some of your tissues, especially in this anterior chain where people feel so smoked. Your hamstrings and glutes are gonna handle this well, but they're gonna be inhibited by how stiff your quads may be. So if I can start adding in some of these isometrics, beautiful. The second thing, or the last thing I wanna say is, of course, I would be putting in some iteration of these step ups every day, and it means that and again, I'm not talking about the training volume, there's plenty of programs here, but a couple things that you can be doing to be thinking about is using your hands to step up, using my hands to step down. I can be thinking about even dropping in both legs and standing up on both legs and even initiating down. And the idea here is that we're gonna be spending a lot of time on a single leg. And so notice that we have you in a split stance, a lot of these things that are kind of traditionally been called unilateral shapes where I'm in a split position. So when we have our rear foot isometrics with the, the split stance, walking lunges, even jumping in these positions, it's clear that I'm obsessed with, hey, how do we get you to spend more time on a single leg? So notice if I can put my hands on my leg, I can limit how much I have to do with a single work, I can sneak the other leg in, and again, even a little quarter lower does a lot to minimize the amount of single leg eccentric work and how much work a single leg does. So, again, we're thinking about environment and lifestyle here. It's an opportunity to address nutrition, sleep, some of those kind of key elements. It's an opportunity to expose yourself to some positions that are gonna challenge your tissues and give them a chance to come on board so that when you do this wonderful workout for a great cause, you come out unharmed, which is our goal.